Hi, I'm Christy Smythe with the Business of Business. I'm here talking to Kimberly Bryant, the uh, founder of Black Girls Code. Kimberly, thanks so much for talking. Thank you so much for having me, Christy. I appreciate your time. Black Girls Code is a phenomenal organization. Everything that I know about it is just so inspiring. What you've done with it um, is amazing. Why did you decide to found Black Girls Code? Well, Black Girls Code, um, as the story goes, and, and it is my story, um, was founded in 2011, primarily because my daughter was going into middle school and really starting to develop this keen interest in computer science and technology. Um, she is and, and was a, an avid gamer. And so when we were looking for ways to really get her to learn these tools of how to become a technologist, when I looked around and, and we live in the Bay Area, um, mm -hmm. I didn't find many organizations that were really doing a lot of work with girls of color. It was more of a, a, an adult co coding movement, if you will, learn to code movement. And in many of the events and, and activities that I was able to get my daughter in, involved in, I found that those rooms were very male centric. So lots of little boys and you know, very few little girls, very few students of color. And so this idea, if you will, for Black Girls Code really evolved around my need and my desire as a mother to have my daughter be able to find her tribe and interact with other girls and be able to feel like she belonged in these spaces. And so BBC started with a very small pilot group of like six girls that were part of her um, first tea golf group that would meet together on the weekends. And I you know, pulled all those girls in and a few other girls from the neighborhood and that's how BGC started. And so it was not originally my intention for this to be more of a global movement, but chapters mm -hmm. of the US, so it, um, a desire to bring a group of girls together with my daughter and, and teach them these skills that I had learned so many years before in college. And it, it really just grew much further than I could ever have imagined. Of course, I think good part of, I, I would say, some of the lessons learned along this journey. So when I founded Black Girls Co., I literally started it with um, my savings that were a part of my 401k. You know, I had just left my corporate employer, started out on my own doing some independent consulting, thinking that I would start my own for-profit company. I, I didn't know what, I just didn't want to be in corporate America anymore. And I was going out on my own and I kind of stumbled across this need, but I didn't have any outside funding sources. I didn't you know, really have a desire to create a nonprofit. So it was really my 401k that started this work. And for, I would say the first year and a half, I was still working full-time as a consultant and doing Black Girls Code at the same time. And the work with Black Girls Code just became so intensive that I, I decided to leave. Like I had interns at the time. I didn't even have employees. I had interns that were working for free. Mm -hmm. Then I was like, it would be great if I could pay this one intern that I ended up with something. So I was like, let me leave and, you know, try to take off for the summer, raise funding, then I'll go back to work, but I'll have enough to pay this one employee number one, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things that's been challenging for the past 10 years is being in high demand, but under-resourced. Um, a lot of, I think, some of the feedback that we've gotten from our team, but also our experiences is that until 2020, like we really were working with less staff than we needed, less resources and funds needed, um, less equipment than we needed. You know, we were, and we, we literally just, this is no joke, like we literally in 2021 just started to buy the staff like new laptops, like you and I were having a problem getting on <laughs> online to do this interview even like I'm still on my old laptop like I haven't updated mine but we didn't have resources to do this work even though we had this you know exponential demand if you will for the work you know I, I've done the mail I've you know been to the bank to the bank deposits I do payroll I've done five jobs <laughs> right <laughs> And so has many, many of the other team members. So I think the biggest challenge that we faced um, over the last 10 years is just being so terribly under-resourced, even in, in the face of such demand for what we do and such excitement for the work that we do. Right. So it really wasn't until 2020 
uh, when we started to get the support coming in during uh, in the wake of the George Floyd protests and such, that we finally started to have adequate resources to both build and hire a team, you know, build in systems and do work and, and assist, build out systems like our Salesforce. Like we didn't have resources to do that before, to do a strategic plan. We never had resources for that before. And so that has probably been the biggest challenge, which is why, you know, that Uber event is so significant for back in 2017, you know, the notion of us turning down a six-figure grant was significant because that was really like one of the yes. largest grants we probably ever was received to that to that point. And so I think that has been the biggest challenge. And and I think on top of that, for me as a founder um, and leadership, you know, leading alone at the top without really having a team, a leadership team, is something that I would never suggest to any other founders. Like it's it's not the way to build. It is the way I built, but I don't suggest it um, because I think it, it puts a tremendous weight on the founder or the person in the lead to, to kind of carry the ship, the load of the ship all by themselves. And that that puts a lot of stress on the organization as well as the leader. And the leader is, is really not equipped to do all of those things as well as, you know, run operations, get the mail, make the payroll. Like it's, it's just not tenable on a long period of time. Right. If I had it to do over again, I think those are the two things that I would really reconsider. I think first of all, I wanted to just, you know, clarify for the record that I'm on a paid administrative leave. So I haven't been um, formally removed from Black Girls Code. Um, but we, it's really a, an administrative leave that was placed on me in December um, because of some workplace issues around personnel that and really uh, prompted some members of the board to opt to do an investigation. And I'm still on hold and, and waiting for that investigation to occur um, so that we can move this issue behind us. Well, much any of the other nonprofit organizations as well as for-profit organizations that um, really transitioned over the last two years of being in the midst of this pandemic and going to a fully virtual organization, we were not um, spared the great resignation. Um, and, and I've seen recent reports that say that nonprofits were some of the most damaged and impacted by this great resignation move that we're seeing in the workforce right now. Black Girls Co. experienced that as well. Most of the people that we hired in 2020 um, came into the organization at a time that we were fully virtual. We were not interacting and working with each other. And so many of the workplace and cultural challenges that we had were actually exacerbated because we did not have time to work with each other in community and really address those things. I think what we saw in 2021 with a few those resignations that we experienced were a result of really an organization that was experiencing rapid growth and really hyper growth in terms of doubling our staff and having a, this influx, incredible influx of revenues and support. We're really trying to figure out how to navigate this and coming from a really small grassroots organization into this highly matrix organization with you know, twice the staff, uh, multi-generational staff that we had not had to manage before. And like many organizations, we really struggled with making that transition, which really led to a lot of the departures and transitions that we experienced in 2020. I definitely know that when we started to experience some transitions from staff members in the middle of the year last year in 2021, mm -hmm. they were all most of those individuals were folks that had joined our organization in the midst of the pandemic. And many of those folks we never even saw except from behind a computer screen because we did not take our organization back into even a hybrid model in our workplace until October of last year. We started to experience these transitions in June, July of last year. So I very much think that a, a factor in this um, 
national um, avalanche that we absolutely was a result of new folks coming into our culture, which was already um, perhaps not as mature as we would like to be, not as healthy as we wanted it to be as a grassroots nonprofit organization. And seeing some of that friction cause a lot of um, the atmospheric um, challenges that we had as an organization and actually brought in some professionals to help us with. So I, I think that as an organization, what we saw was a need to bring in some external resources, which we did in terms of bringing in a cultural strategist, as well as really bringing in an external organization to do a workforce study on our compensation policy and philosophy, as well as bringing in an executive coach to work with our senior leadership team and our executives, all with you know and in mind to really build this um, workplace around social equity and justice. And that is the work that we've been doing for the last six months as an organization, um, not necessarily doing that in concert with our board of directors. Well, I, I can say that as an organization, as we've grown as an organization, I can think back to um, probably some of the best years that I have experienced in the organization back in 2018, um, early 2019, was when as an organization, like we were in the trenches doing this work together. So some of my closest work friends and work mates who have been part of the organization, you know, we would spend hours in the office, like, yes, we were doing a lot of work. We had a lot of work. This organization has been growing rapidly since we started, but a lot of that been together uh, was not necessarily doing work. It was getting to know each other as people. Some of those folks that I worked with in our Oakland office in 2018, really most of them, you know, we create such a close familial bond that those folks actually helped me take my daughter to college when she started in college as a freshman. So it's those type of work relationships and bonds that I think really help to create a solid foundation, especially when you're doing work like ours, which can be hard, it can be challenging, it can be stressful. Now, I, I don't want to say that, oh, you have to be friends with everyone that you work with, but I think that some of the challenges that we face as an organization are no different than what we see in many other workplaces around the country, especially at, at a time like this in the midst of, you know, a stressful external events such as the pandemic and not being able to commune with each other and build that culture that, that really creates for a healthy work environment. I do think that as the organization has evolved and matured, we're perhaps at a place where as a social justice organization that just does our work and from a social justice lens on top of this, this need or this mission to teach girls about technology, we probably have grown or, or transitioned from the type of board that we started with in 2018 into a need for a bit more advocacy in terms of our board of directors that are closer aligned with our mission around social justice and equity. What I think I saw as a founder is um, a misalignment in terms of mission and vision and goals as well as that we were building this culture on a BGC with those board of directors who started with us in 2018. That really is what is evident now as we're in this, the midst of this um, push or pull challenge, if you will. Yeah, so it's interesting that I started my journey. I'm an electrical engineer um, mm -hmm. by training with a bachelor's in electrical engineer and a minor in computer science. So when I was going to get my bachelor's degrees back in the middle of the 80s, it was really more women receiving bachelor's in CS than there are today. Uh, it didn't seem that way, though. It was right in the middle of the 80s when mm -hmm. Web.1 was just starting to emerge. And, and that's a fact. You know, I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really that, that much older, <laughs> if you will. Like I was at the beginning of this movement. And so I think for me, I was really intrigued by technology. So my very first class was, you know, learning how to code in Fortran, which my daughter will look at me crazy if I even say Fortran, she doesn't know what that is. <laughs> but that's what I learned. And I, I think for me, it was just really this, this pull of this new thing, like this WWW, I remember vividly, like 
seriously, like being in my first job and actually one of my peers saying like, hey, there's this new thing called the internet. And if you type in www, and then I think we had a very long list of numbers that we had to type <laughs> in to get into the internet. That was real. And it was just like a new world emerged at that time. And so for me, I think it was just this notion of this was the new frontier like you know i remember the the earliest apple and macintosh um, computers the little boxes and you know how excited we were to actually have something like that that we could take home so i think for me it was just that piece of of learning something new and being on the forefront of this emerging industry that was just starting to unfold i think i still feel that though like i think for me those um, excitement about something new that I experienced back in the mid 80s and getting on the internet it, type of excitement that I you know, and, and really starting to dip into web three and and get my feet wet like on crypto and nfts and exploring that world of the blockchain I think we're still at another stage of like really going into the next generation of what the internet will be Well, I am still very hopeful that we will be able to resolve this situation um, with the board of directors as soon as possible. Um, I'm still very hopeful that that will be the case. So I do believe that I still have work to do at Black Rose Code. Um, I'm not one of those founders that intends to be in my organization for 20 or 30 years, um, but I do have some work that I need to get done. You know, There is still foundation that I hope to leave with my organization. Um, there's succession planning that I hope to complete at my organization. And I absolutely do intend to be part of my board of directors you know, for many years to come. You know, this situation has really sort of opened my eyes to how issues like this are more common than they are rare. Um, over the last three weeks, I've had probably 20 or 30 individuals, mostly women, uh, many women of color, that have come to me with stories very similar to mine. And in the midst of doing my work, I, I wasn't even aware that this sort of thing happened. I think, you know, like many nonprofit founders that start um, in this industry without a lot of experience, like we're unaware of like some of the gaps and challenges around nonprofit governance and the model itself. And so for me, part of what I wanna do in the future is really lean into advocacy I think, you know, in 2020, there certainly was, you know, I think this rush to support organizations and, and founders of color, but there's still a gap when we look at these models and structures of leadership and power that often tend to disenfranchise women, especially women once they're in a leadership role. And I feel very privileged, you know, even in the midst of, I want to say this storm, I feel extremely privileged because I do have a platform. There are other women who have experienced this type of um, injustice, if you will, I'll just call it as I see it, and they can't speak on it, or if they can't have a platform that I have. And I feel that it's important for me to use the privilege that I have gained to become a voice for others, to create support systems for other women in leadership, to share my story to other women so they, don't make the mistakes that I made. So I can share with them how they can create strong governance models within their organizations that protects the vision of the organization as well as themselves and, and what they have built so they have a lasting legacy. So this advocacy work will be very much a part of what I do in the future. And then I think beyond that is like really taking the work that I've done over the last 10 years with BGC to the next level. Um, I do want to do more in the tech industry. I do want to lean into Web3. And I do want to do work that empowers other women to build. That's great. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for talking. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for sharing my story. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to subscribe to our channel for more interviews like this and for more content like this coming soon.